11, it's about 11.02 now. Um, so we shall have you open us up in a word of prayer and we'll jump right in for today. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, we can see you. Beautiful. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. We're going to jump right in. Um, since uh, everybody's kind of logged on already, um, I can't see your faces, but I will soon. It's um, a rainy day here in Rochester and a little cold, but I hope it's beautiful where you are because it's a beautiful day anytime we get to come into the presence of the Lord together. Amen. As family, Amen. as friends, as brothers and sisters. And so we are just going to pray. We're going to give thanks this morning. We're going to praise him this morning. And then we're going to get straight into the word today. Is that all right with everybody? Amen. So um, like I said, I always say this. This is the time where you can unmute um, yourselves. There is something special and beautiful, beautiful about hearing your voices as we give God honor and praise and glory this morning. If you want to stay muted, that's fine. But wherever you are, I challenge you this morning just to lift up your voices. Um, you may be in your car, in your home, on your way somewhere, in your, wherever you are. Um, I challenge you to, to um, give him the sacrifice of praise this morning by opening up your mouth and just bless him. And so, Father, we thank you this morning. Father, we bless your name this morning. Father, we give you praise and honor and glory uh, for just us being awake this morning, for us to have breath in our lungs today. Um, I have been so aware this week of how much death and dying that we have surrounded us, not only in our own city, but across this nation. And so I thank you right now, Father, for your life. Yes. I thank you right now for your breath in our lungs this thank morning. You, I thank you right now, Father, that we woke up this morning to come together, yes, yes. keep your face, to concentrate on you, to not be distracted by what this world is trying to pull us from, but to yes. connect this morning in a new and a more powerful way. I thank you, yes, Father, yes. that you are our God. You are our Heavenly Father. You, you are the one that does not turn his face, but you're forever seeking us. You're forever moving towards us. You're forever pulling us. Your word says that your right hand is strong to save. And with your right hand, you are still drawing people unto you. I thank you now for the draw of the Father unto us this morning. I thank you now that our eyes are open, that our ears are not open, not to the natural, but to the spirit this morning. Yes. That our hearts are soft. They are not hardened, but they're soft, ready to believe your word ready to understand your word, ready to receive your word. And so I thank you right now that all the noise is quieted right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you right now that we are holding in on you, that we are attuned to the frequency of heaven, Father. I thank you, Lord, that even as your word goes forth, uh, that it goes forth with clarity, that it goes forth with purpose, that it goes forth with power, that it goes forth yes, with yes, yes. understanding today, that there be renewed perspective, perspective today, that there be renewed hope and joy and peace today. Your word says that the peace of God that passes yes. all understanding yes. in our, yes. our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Yes. Let there be a boundary of peace. Let there be a wall of peace. Let there be a stronghold yes. that's directed yes. around us. And I thank you right now yes. that the joy of the Lord returns yes. to the hearts of men and women. Yes. Because we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Mm -hmm. So let's strength yes. arise. Let's Courage arise right now in the name of Jesus. And as we open up our mouths to give you honor, to give you glory, yes, yes, but it has to be acceptable in your sight. Thank yes. you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you right now, Father, for your strength and your, your love to over the people. So we thank you, Lord, that we are the righteousness of God. Yes, and yes. We are sons and daughters, ears to yes, the most high. Yes. And we thank you right now that as yes. we call you our yes. Father, that allows us rights yes. and privileges yes. and promises that are still yes and amen. Yes. And so yes. I thank you, God, for, your, for you are Alpha and Omega, the beginning oh, yes. and the end. And you yes. are everything, Father. Yes. You are King of Kings and you are yes. Lord of Lords. And so yes. we put you in your rightful place, Father, today. Yes. As the king of our hearts, as the king of our minds, yes. the king of our lives. So yes. I thank you, Lord Father, for your good and your yes. mercy endures forever. Your good yes. and your grace still yes. abounds. Your yes. good yes. and your grace is still sufficient for us, Father. Yes. And so we bless your name. Yes, Lord. Bless your name. We thank we you for it. Name, In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 
Amen. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm excited to come before you this morning. I give an honor to my, my father in his absence, give honor to my mother. Um, today we have a very interesting topic, and uh, we're doing a little bit different than usual. Um, our topic is called Righteous Servanthood. It's called Righteous Servanthood. It's almost taking two topics and placing them into one. Um, we've been talking a lot about holiness. Last week was all about holiness, about becoming whole in Christ. And so today we want to talk a lot about servanthood. We know God sent Jesus here as his only begotten son to be a servant. Even though he's king, he came as a servant. Um, righteousness is a standard. It's a way of life. It's an adjective. And so we're going to talk about righteous servanthood. So my responsibility is to talk about righteousness. And then Leisha is going to handle the majority of our conversation about servanthood. So I'm going to try to break down righteousness in about 15 minutes. And then I'm going to hand it off to her to talk through servanthood. Um, if we don't understand righteousness, it's going to be very challenging for us to understand servanthood. So the day we became born again, the day we accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, his righteousness was imputed on us. The same way we are born into sin, the moment we become born again into Christ, into Jesus, righteousness is now imputed unto you. Um, and 2 Corinthians, I'm going to go through a few scriptures rather quickly just to set the ground for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, God made him, talking about Jesus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So in him, when you accept him as Lord and Savior, your faith in him makes you the righteousness of God. Amen. You cannot earn righteousness. It is imputed. It is, it is uh, given to you. It's the free gift of salvation. You are made righteous. Once you become righteous, I'm not going to go too far into this now, but you are sealed with the Holy Spirit upon salvation. And as a result of that, you are the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. When you fall short of grace or when you fall to temptation and when you fall into sin, because of what Jesus did on Calvary, you are still the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. We cannot allow the enemy to pull us into shame and condemnation based on behaviors. Amen. Your behaviors do not dictate your righteousness. Mm -hmm. Your faith in Jesus dictates your righteousness. And that's a significant difference. So Amen. even when you fall short, I dare you to stand up and say, I am still the righteousness of Amen. God. Amen. What it does is it places your mind back in the right uh, frame of mindset. It gives you, puts you right back mm -hmm. Remembrance of what Jesus has already done on Calvary, that no matter how many good things you do, you still can't earn this righteousness. Yes. Um, yes. Right after I gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, and he was going through the Ten Commandments, and one of the first things that he did was he gave him the instructions for sacrifice. So he said, here's my law, here's my commandments, um, and when someone breaks these commandments, here is the law for a sacrifice. This is the instruction on how do you sacrifice to get back into my grace. Um, we are under this new covenant of grace through Jesus Christ. Uh, under a new covenant, it is righteousness is of faith. We're going to talk about that a little bit more detail. But in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He's saying this is reasonable in terms of the service that I ask of you, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So you are still living, but you sacrifice that thing that you call life to live a life full of Christ, to live a life occupied by the, whole, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. There's another scripture that says that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. This mm -hmm. means that the life that you had, the life of your own fulfillment, your own desires, you are to now die to and follow the life that is in Christ, where he becomes the head, where he leads and guides you into all truth, all understanding, mm -hmm. revelation, wisdom, instruction. 
we talk about, you hear the phrase practice make perfect. And we know that that statement is a little bit false because practice doesn't really make perfect. It makes permanence. When you practice something over and over, this is how you develop habits. And when you do things consistently, they become habits. So it becomes more permanent in terms of your character or your behavior. You can learn the wrong thing really well. Uh, that's as we know how bad habits are formed. So in 1 Timothy 6 and 11, it says, flee from this and pursue righteousness. God is always trying to get us to pursue after righteousness. He said, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the other things will be added unto you. He's consistently pushing us to pursue his righteousness. Proverbs 21, 21. Whoever pursues righteousness and loves finds prosperity and honor. Again, he's trying to get us to pursue his righteousness. We are in the new covenant. Righteousness is our faith. The pursuit of righteousness is the pursuit of faith. Uh, Psalms 37, 28. For the, for the Lord loves the just. Uh, the just is just a synonym. It still means righteousness. The Lord loves the just, which is the righteous, and will not forsake his faithful ones. God will never forsake the righteous. Psalms 37, 25. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging for bread. Uh, Psalms 34, 15 says the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. You see over and over and over again, God is attentive towards the righteous. God is has his heart, his minds, his eyes fixed on the righteous. He said, I will never forsake the righteous. Who are the righteous? The people who have accepted him as Lord and Savior, but there's a standard of righteousness. That's why he said that the, the just shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. In the new covenant, righteousness is of faith. So when I say is of faith, I'm going to uh, articulate that a little further so you have a better understanding of what I mean. I'm going to take you back to the, to the uh, this was probably middle school day. I remember this um, formula because I used to always get stuck in school on figuring out percentages. And then one teacher taught me, she says, is over of X over 100. And then you multiply and divide them crossways. And then you can figure out the percentage. So that always stuck with me. So is over of. Let's start with righteousness. Righteousness is of faith. Is over of. So the of is always going to be the denominator. It is the main variable. It is the, the source. Righteousness is of faith. So that means righteousness stems from faith. Another good example. Uh, we talk about the son of God. God is the denominator. God is the source. The son comes from God. The son is sent from God. When we are in Christ, we become sons of God. Faith equals the substance of things hoped for. Hebrews 11.1, 1, we all know the scripture. It's the substance of things hoped for. And then it says it's the evidence of things not seen. Things are the common denominator in regards to faith, evidence of things, substance of things. What are these things? I told you we are in this new covenant of grace and the new covenant of grace, according to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He tells us everything pertaining to life and godliness has now been made available. It says, given unto us all things, everything that pertains to life and godliness. So that means everything, no exceptions. If it pertains to God, if it pertains to life, it has been made available in this new covenant of grace. We know that Jesus is grace and truth. He is God, unmerited favor into the earth. So Faith is the denominator. Righteousness is the numeral. Evidence of things, substance of things. Let's talk about what this actually means. Evidence. 
When you go in a courtroom, evidence is something that they try to get you to see and experience. Why? Because it causes you to believe. Mm -hmm. Evidence is presented to give you things that you can see or experience so that you can feel you're actually there, like you're actually experiencing them. So evidence is things that you see or experience. And you can put here as well, because seeing and hearing collectively brings forth full understanding. It's a good note to write down. Seeing and hearing together brings forth full understanding. God gives us vision of the heart so that you can see with your vision instead of your carnal sight. Amen, amen. Faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So he's going to give you things that you can see or experience that are evidence of these things. What things? The things that pertain to life and godliness, the things that he wants you to call those things, mm -hmm. which be not as though they were. Amen. Because they're not in the flesh, because they're not in the physical, doesn't mean they're not in the spiritual. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm going to give you this mm -hmm. It's the evidence of things. I'm going to give you evidence. I'm allowing you to hear it. I'm allowing you to see it. Why? So you can call those things which be not as though they were. Mm -hmm. And then it says faith is the substance. Substance is the Hebrew term, I'm sorry, the Greek term hypostasis. It's the substance of things hoped for. Substance is the quality of confidence that allows you to believe. Watch how that coincides with evidence. So he gives you evidence. He allows you to see through the vision of your heart. He allows you to hear the word. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the rhema word of God. Why does he give you that evidence? So that you can have confidence. Yes. Confident for what? Confidence to rest. Mm -hmm. That word hypostasis and substance, faith means confidence, substance is hypostasis, which means I'm giving you the confidence to stand on my word. I gave you this evidence so that you can be confident enough to believe. Faith is the noun, believe is the verb, putting faith into action. I gave you evidence so that you can have confidence of these things in the covenant of grace, so that you can stand on them boldly, stand on them confidently, and that you can believe. So righteousness is of faith. Righteousness is of faith. To be in right standing, to come boldly above the throne of grace, uh, seeking all that you may ask of God, it takes evidence, it takes confidence to stand and to believe that is right relationship with God, but it's all predicated on faith. It's grounded in faith. So yes, righteousness has been imputed on you, but you have to walk this thing out. And in order to walk out righteousness, in order to stay in right standing, in order to operate according to how he, his purpose of, our, of his will for our life, it comes through faith. Faith is the denominator. Evidence substance for confidence, the evidence of belief is rest. So Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. And he said, I only say what I hear the Spirit say. We know that's what a life of faith looks like, being directed by the Spirit, everything coming by way of the Spirit. So what is righteousness in terms of faith for servanthood? It's the, it's the common questions. It's the who, what, when, where, why, and how, right? So God wants to know who can I send? This is a life led by faith. I got five minutes to wrap this up. This is a life led by faith. Isaiah 6 and 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here I am, Lord, send me. Faith is looking for the relationship with God and righteousness. So God can send forth who he desires, where he desires, when he desires, how he desires. It's all about being under the will of God that is in right standings with God. So the very first thing is who? Harper came down on me. First is the who. Who can I send? 
who's available where so-and-so at work, she's unavailable. Our schedule is packed. His schedule is packed. He got this going on. He got their going on. They're not, they don't have no time to meditate on my word. They're, we're, we're not in right standing right now. We can't communicate well. Who am I going to send? This is why Jesus said, will I find any faith on the earth when I return? Is there anybody available for me to send? There's so much work to be done. Who can I send? Can I send? The next is the what? What do God need you to accomplish? When, when God was talking to Ananias in the story of, of Saul to Paul, um, he said, I need you to go over on Straight Street. He's giving him very specific instructions. I need you to go over on Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man named Tarsus, named Saul. He is praying to me right now. This is the what. God wants to communicate through faith so that he can tell you not only who, but what needs to be done. After you know the what, the when and the where are critical. When and where, God is a very uh, precise being. He, he, he deals in the precision and the perfectiveness of everything that he does. He likes everything done with clarity and precision. Um, location, destination, time, where, <laughs> He's very precise. He always gives these very precise instructions, but we have to be made available and in right relationship awaiting these level of instructions. Uh, the why and the how are very particular as well. Sometimes God gives you the why, sometimes he doesn't. Amen. Sometimes he gives it to you in pieces, sometimes you might not get it at all. Amen. If he gave you the why to everything, then you wouldn't have a reason to trust him. Amen. He's looking for the right relationship of trust mm -hmm. and believing him and following him, even when you don't got all the details and answers. Amen. Sometimes he doesn't give you the why. I'm wrapping up in three minutes. Sometimes he doesn't give you the why mm -hmm. simply because if he told you why, you probably wouldn't go because it's usually that significant. Imagine if he told Moses, hey, I want you to go over here and rescue the children of Israel, take them away from Pharaoh, and lead them out to the desert. And oh, by the way, while you're in the desert, Pharaoh's going to send his army running after you with chariots, and they're going to have weapons, they're going to have spears, and they're going to be coming to take you guys' life. You're going to be pinned against the Red Sea with no way of escape. And then, just behold, I'm going to open it up and allow you guys to walk through the sea. <laughs> who's signing up for that? Walk through the sea? People are not running. When you know how big and large of an assignment God has on your life, if he gives you the full why in the beginning, most people probably wouldn't go. Amen. Amen, baby. He tells you what you need to know to get you started, and then he gives you faith and revelation and wisdom and guidance as you go along. Amen. Yes. The very last is the how. This is what you need faith for. Faith gives you this revelation. It gives you the details of the how. You, we can't do things how we desire to do them. God is very particular in how he wants things accomplished. If he gave you the plan, then God's responsible for the plan. If he gives you the vision, then he's responsible for the resources to carry out that vision. Um, I made that mistake significantly time and time again where God gave me a vision for something, and then I go start doing a bunch of words to try to carry out his vision. He always reels me back in and says, son, that's my vision you're going to have to meditate on my words to understand my plan concerning that vision. And so we need his help. We need his resources. We need his, his revelation to carry out the why mm -hmm. and both the how. And so here's my last statement. Um, God told Moses to tap the rock. This is in Numbers chapter 20, verse 7. He said, you and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock. This is when he was giving water to the children of Israel. You are to speak to the rock while they watch, and it will pour out its water. That was the instructions from God to Moses. Moses goes out there. This is Numbers 20, chapter 20, verse 10. It says, Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, listen, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he struck the rock twice. God said, I want you to go out there and speak to this rock and outpour the water. 
Amen. Moses went out there and spoke to the people and then struck the rock twice. He did it how he desired to do it. And when he came back to God, the first thing God says, because you didn't believe me, because of your disobedience, you will not be the one to take the people through the promised land. That is how he wanted that miracle to be performed. The miracle was still performed. The water still came out of the rock. But there was a precise way in God wanted to be glorified. Yes. So he might give you vision, but you still have to seek him on how to carry that thing out. We don't get to just pick and choose how we're going to carry out his work. We have to mm -hmm. seek after his will because now we can serve him from the state of righteousness. And that righteousness is of faith. Man. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stop there. I think I just, just got into my 20 minutes right on time. <laughs> um, I want to give you a, a quick glimpse of what righteousness is, the importance of it, how it relates to faith, how it could coincides with faith. We need faith to operate in righteousness. And now Alicia is going to talk to you about servanthood so you can understand righteous servanthood. Man. All right, guys, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay perfect. So I'm going to go into righteous servanthood and um, as you can see, uh, I, for the people who have um, been on a teaching before when I've done it, uh, my style is a little bit different. Um, so I actually have slides that I'm going to show you guys and I'm going to go back and forth between sharing my screen so you can see my slides and um, actually seeing my face as I talk through some things with you guys. Because um, uh, it helps you see the scriptures, it helps you, it helps me stay on, on task and can, gives me kind of clues as to, as we move through this teaching, because I want it to be very clear with you guys. So Man. I'll share my screen and make sure all of that is good. So, um, can you guys see this on my screen? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Um, so we're going to talk a little about righteous servanthood. I'm going to give a full disclaimer this morning. I, as I've been preparing for this, do not feel that we can talk about what it means to be a servant if we don't understand kingdom. And so what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to lay the foundation uh, for kingdom. And I promise you it's all going to make sense. Um, and so once we have an understanding of what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God, then we'll understand what it means to serve <clears throat> that kingdom. And so I know um, I, I'm so I even said this before we got started. I'm so excited to see like new faces on these on these Zoom calls. And so and people who have been may have been being, been on before, but may have missed a couple of weeks and now are on today. So I do not assume that everybody has the same understanding or remembers completely the things that we've talked about previously. So I love repetition. It helps me understand. It gives me re more revelation. And so I'm going to go through some concepts first that I think we need to both understand and come into agreement to before we lay the foundation for what righteous servanthood is. So I thank Morris for such a great um, explanation. And so keep that in the back of your mind as we talk about what it means to be a servant. So I always like to start in the beginning. And I have said this before, if you guys, I think if you spend time in Genesis in that first chapter of Genesis, um, you're gonna get revelation on top of revelation and top of revelation about who you are and who God is. And so let's start with, at the beginning, let's start with Genesis. It's Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 27. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. So we know this from last week and previous weeks, but again, I know there's new people on here. So that word man in Genesis chapter one is not Adam. A lot, we, I grew up thinking that when God said, let's create man, he, at that moment, he was just creating Adam. But the Hebrew word for man is Adam. And that Hebrew word means mankind. God was creating mankind. He was creating a species of, of, of being. He was creating humanity as a whole in that moment. 
And so Adam means mankind, it's a plural word. So that means that he was creating humanity in that moment. And when God says he created man in his own image and in his likeness, that means that he created mankind with his essential nature and in, in his essential, in essential form or pattern after him. God created mankind in that moment, especially when he said, let us, he's creating a species of being that is looks like him in characteristics and in shape and form. So what now, whatever is in God is now in mankind because we are created in his image and in his likeness. So Adam does not come. That's Genesis chapter one. Adam actually is not formed, the Adam that we think about in Genesis chapter two. Go back and read it because we think that man popped up right then when God was saying, let us make man, the man that we think. But Adam comes in Genesis 2. So it says the Lord then formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So man that carried whatever was in God, which is really spirit, because we know God is spirit. God created a spirit in a species that was like him. And then he breathed into this species the breath of life, and he became a living soul, a living being. And that's where we get the word human form from. So man is this creation of God, spirit, and then humus, or the word human, is Latin for earth. So when God went into the dust of the ground and formed this material body, he created a human, mm -hmm. a human body for a spirit to dwell in. So we, as humans, are spirits that live in this earth bodysuit, and we possess a soul. He breathed into man, and man became a living soul. Mm -hmm. Spirit living in a body had its own mind, its own will, and its own emotions. Does that make sense? Amen. Okay. So now we're, we have humans. We have Adam. It goes on to say, he, Adam, he made Eve. Um, and the original design in that garden was now humans who had the spirit of God living on the inside of them, the full spirit of God living on the inside of them. And they were completely led by the spirit. And I use that word inter interdependent because man's spirit and God's spirit, as Morris said last week, were intermingled. And because they're, and they're interdependent because man still has a, had a choice, as you know. So God wasn't pulling puppet strings, but God's spirit had control because God, because man chose for it to have control. Because mm -hmm. you know, when we got to the, to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, man made a choice. Mm -hmm. And so in the original design, man's soul, because the spirits are in perfect communion, man's soul, his mind, will, and emotions are in perfect communion with God. And he is anointed. You see, after all creation is made, God makes man, and then man, God gives man assignments. So Adam had the assignment of naming things. One of his first assignments was to name things. So yeah. God gives man assignments. So that word, part of that, that um, the definition of anointing is that you are chosen to fulfill tasks that he has given you. And that's evidenced by Adam's first assignment in the garden to name animals. And I come back to that because how did Adam know how, what to name an animal? We've talked about this before. The reason why Adam had the wisdom and the knowledge to name animals who he had never seen before, had never in contact before because his soul and his spirit were in perfect communion with God. Mm -hmm. He had divine wisdom and divine knowledge to carry out the assignment that God gave him. Amen. So Adam had, or mankind had in the original design, knowledge, like I said, righteousness means that they were in perfect in alignment that they had the evidence to carry out where they could see or believe because righteousness is our faith they were having that in real time in every moment because they were in perfect communion they had real time faith happening every single second to do to say to move whatever wherever wherever god wanted them to do and they were whole they were holy because they were whole they were complete because the operation of the spirit was perfect communicating with the soul and then the body. So they had knowledge, they had righteousness, they had holiness. But man made a decision. 
And when he made that decision, he died. And I want to be clear, he died that day. Amen. Mankind died that day. And that word died when it refers to what happened in that garden, the Thanatos. That's the, the Hebrew word. And that means he became consciously existing, but separated from God. Amen. And that is what we call a spiritual death. Mm -hmm. We all have experience because Adam, mankind experienced it. And we are the descendants of, man, of Adam, of that garden. And so there is a spiritual death that ultimately leads to a physical death. But how many people know that you can be living today physically, but still dead spiritually? Amen. And Amen. Constant, this conscious existence from, that you are separated from God. Amen. Amen. That's the and result I of their sin. Of their, yeah. of their rebellion against the instruction of God. And so because of that separation from God, Adam had, instead of the spirit being his source, instead of God being his source, Adam, mankind, Adam and Eve, and their descendants had to be their own source. Mm -hmm. Ground wouldn't produce anymore. There was pain and labor. They had to be their own source. And then they lost those things that they had. True knowledge, knowledge of the truth, divine wisdom, they lost their right standing, their righteousness, and their holy, and they lost their completeness. They lost their holiness. Mm -hmm. So why is it so important when we talk about the concept of a kingdom? Because in that beginning verse, God says, let us make man. So we understand now who man is, right? Man comes, he's humanities. And what does he say? Let them have dominion. Let them have yeah. the, the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth. So God created man for something. He created you for something. And it says right here, the opening chapter of the book of this word of God was that man was supposed to have dominion. That word dominion um, in the Hebrew language is rada. It's the same word that we use for kingdom today in our English language. So dominion is kingdom. So Man. kingdom, and again, I, I believe this is so important as we talk about being servants. Kingdom is the governing influence of a king over a territory, impacting it with his will, his purpose, his intent, producing a citizenship of people who become a colony, who reflect the image of the nature, the lifestyle, the knowledge, and the culture of that king. So think about that. Kingdom is the influence of a king over a territory. And that influence is through his will, his purposes, his intents, his culture, his practices. And so God is saying, let, uh, let my children have kingdom. Let them have dominion through me, mm -hmm. the earth, okay? Amen. So I would submit to you to think about the Bible or think about what happens in the Bible, not just about us coming and having what we call a religion or having um, Jesus just coming back to save us, but the Bible is about a king and him trying to establish his kingdom. Amen. So we know that a lot of things that we see in our earthly realm mirror the spiritual realm. And one thing that we can draw correlations from is what kingdoms have done on this earth. I'm, I'm from, um, my parents are from, are from Jamaica. Now, a lot of the Caribbean islands were British colonies. Mm -hmm. Because they were British colonies, there are a lot of, there are things that we do in Jamaica or in the Bahamas or in other Caribbean islands that a lot of people don't do. Number, the, the, my favorite one is drive on the left side of the road. The only reason why people in Jamaica drive on the left-hand side of the road is because people in England drive on the left side mm -hmm. of the road. That's the only reason why we do that because we were colonized by the English who brought to Jamaica their culture, their mm -hmm their purposes, their practices. And so we adopted them because we were controlled by them. Yes. So kings, what they all kings want to do is they want to expand. Kings want to expand and they want to, once they expand, they want to establish control. 
And once they extravagant control, they want that control to, to exhibit their culture, their will, their practices on the people that they take control over. Mm -hmm. So kings never colonize a territory with the people of that territory. They send people from their kingdom to that territory to colonize them. And they send them by the way of governors, people who come from the kingdom to the territory to teach the practices, to establish culture, to counsel people, and to gain control. Very similar to what God wants to do on this earth. God wants to colonize this earth with heaven through you. Amen. That is his goal. That has always been his goal. It's still his goal today that he wants to colonize, establish control over earth with heaven. So he does that again through us. And we've always grown up thinking that we <clears throat> may have, have, we may have missed this in our growing up about teaching about power and authority. And we talked about it before, but you having dominion means you have control. The problem is, is when sin came into the, into the picture, we lost that control. We gave up that control. We gave up that control because we gave up connection. So thank God for Jesus. Because when Adam sinned, he declared himself independent from God. Amen. He separated himself from God. Mm -hmm. When he separated him from God, the governor or the governance or the thing that was leading him and guiding him, mm -hmm. the governor and the Holy Spirit, just to use these two parallels, had to leave. Because once he became independent, the Holy Spirit could not dwell in that vessel anymore. Amen. We know that the word says, and I, I'm jumping ahead of myself, that your body now is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. But because Adam sinned, he separated that connection with the, with the spirit. And once the governor leaves, once that Holy Spirit leaves, kingdom is gone. Mm -hmm. So we see all in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit came on a person. But we have no evidence in the Old Testament that Holy Spirit in filling a person or being filled with a person. We don't see that until Jesus comes back on the scene. And so Jesus not only came back to save, to rescue, but he came back to restore. And I hope to prove that, that he came back to restore that original design that we saw with Adam in the garden. That's why they call him the second Adam, because the first Adam couldn't do what he did. Yes. So he's the second Adam because he came back to restore that original uh, mm -hmm. design. So just like I said, he shed his blood so we could be a suitable place for that Holy Spirit to come back again, for that, for that, the, for that force to teach us and to counsel us and to guide us and to reveal to us to come back and live inside of us. Um, his first public statement. So Jesus is now on the scene. He's starting his miss missionary. What does he say? His first thing that he says is found in, in Matthew 4, 17. He says, from that time, it just means from that time forth, from that time moving forward, Jesus began to preach saying, repent. That word repent means, um, in the Greek, it's metanoia, which means change your mind, change your perspective, change your thought patterns change how you view a thing for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's mm -hmm. the first thing Jesus says when he comes on the scene is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your mind because what was going on around him was that people were looking for this earthly kingdom to come back, mm -hmm. but there's a switch of control and power. Jesus comes and say, repent, change your mind. It's not an earthly kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he became the example for what kingdom looks like on earth. Amen. This is always the example. Yes, he came to save. Yes, he came to restore. But he came to be an example as well. And so um, his works and his instructions were example. First to his disciples, to the people who were closest to him, and then to the world. Um, there was, there was, um, the Pharisees were, were getting at Jesus 
because he was doing all these miracles and they were saying, you must be of the devil because you're doing all these things, you must be of the devil. His response in Luke eleven twenty 20 was, but if the, with the finger of God, I cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. So he's talking about the casting out of devils. He's talking about the freedom of people from bondage with the kingdom of God coming upon them. In Luke 10, 9, he tells the disciples, heal the sick that are there, and say unto them, after you've healed them, the kingdom of God is come nigh to you. He's now telling people what the kingdom consists of, the mm -hmm. demonstration of the kingdom, the actions of the kingdom, casting out devils, healing the sick. When those things happen, the kingdom has come. The word says the kingdom is not in, I think it's in word or deed, but it's in power and in demonstration. So he's showing us that there's a demonstrative part of the kingdom that should be seen mm -hmm. here. Um, Luke 17 says, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, mm -hmm. or it says he answered them, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, Man. lo here or lo there, for the behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Yes. Within mm -hmm. you. It's within you because the spirit of God. Mm -hmm is within you. So I put this slide in here because Morris talked about this a little bit last week, but this, this process of being saved when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he was raised from the dead, that saved, sanctified, and the Holy Spirit filled is a process. So even when Jesus comes back as the sacrifice, as the, as the perfect sacrifice, and he leaves us and allows the Holy Spirit to be left with us, that Holy Spirit has a work to do. There is a process of consecration, setting yourself apart, a, a, a process of dedication, a process of sanctification where you are furnished with what you need for the Holy Spirit to do the work of the ministry. You are furnished, furnished with what you need to be um, representatives of God. And then there is a point where you become so filled with the Holy Spirit that you become the fullness of God again in human form. Amen. But it is a process. We know it's a process because we know that when we get saved, our spirit man is saved, but our soul, our minds, our wills, our emotions are not, are not always and not immediately conformed to, the, to what Christ is like. Amen. So, but there is an end game. And that end game is that for you to go back to that original design of being full of the spirit of God in a human body, in a dirt body, mm -hmm. And because you become that, you are then anointed. You then have the power. You then have the ability to be commissioned and chosen for the task. And that anointing, that state is when, it really is what the word Christ means. Christ just means the anointed one. Yes. Jesus being the example is an example for you to follow. So all our goals today is to be like him, to put on his might and be the anointed one. So um, again, it says, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely have ye received, freely ye give. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's showing us what the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be. But again, he's showing us that because he wants that kingdom to colonize. Mm -hmm. So I put this up because we, we all know that if there's a kingdom of heaven, there must be some other kingdom. If there's a, if, if the kingdom of heaven has to come down to earth, there must be something that we're coming down to replace or to change or to take over. Mm -hmm. Second Corinthians 4, 4 says, Satan who is the God of this world. Um, and I wanna be careful about world because we talked about this word before. World in many instances means cosmos or the, or the practices or the, 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 the way things are op the operation of this world. This world, world means this age. So Satan is the God, little g, of this age, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory, the nature, the manifestation of Christ. Who is the exact likeness of God? This is what we're up against. We're up, uh, up against a God of this age 
whose primary primary um his primary goal is to blind the minds of those who are ready to believe. Amen. They're unable to see. Mm -hmm. They're unable to understand kingdom. They're unable to understand faith because if they found out that they could be kingdom servants on this earth, they would eventually be Christ, mm -hmm. anointed ones. They will be exactly like God, exactly like that original design made in his image and likeness, but inhabiting this earth for him. So we have the God of this age who is adamantly against the kingdom of God being manifest on this earth. And people, um, I grew up thinking that um, there's, a, there's a verse in the Bible that says, be ye perfect even as your father is perfect. And a lot of people grew up having problems with that. Like, how can we be perfect? We're sinners, we're born in sin. We're shaping it. There's no way we can be perfect. Yes, you can. Even Jesus has said, himself, calls us gods with the little g in the word he says in psalms 82 6 i said you are god sons of the most high all of you what just means is that we are made in this image and this likeness we are not him but we are made in this image of in his likeness that is why when we talked about kingdom and god god asking for us to come to this earth or sending us to this earth he calls himself king of kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. It just means he's he's the most high, but we are kings on this earth and Lord <clears throat> on this earth. Lord, the other word for Lord just means owner. Mm -hmm. he gave you dominion, when he gave you kingdom, he said, go to the earth and own it. Own it for me, inhabit it for me, but yeah. it's yours to, to control. Mm -hmm. So we're getting into servanthood. I promise you, I get you here and we're getting into servanthood. But I have to deal with this word ambassador and what that means. And 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, In Christ God, he was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us to the message of reconciliation. Reconciliation. Um, if you guys remember our teaching about the word re in front of something, that, that prefix re is bringing something back. So God wants us to, to give a message for us to come back to him. Um, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us for our sake, he made him, and we talked about this just earlier, more started with this, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So St. Corinthians is telling us that therefore, through this ministry of reconciliation, this ministry of God, of God sending Jesus, allowing a way for us to be reconciled, to be reunited, to get back to the original design, we are therefore now ambassadors for Christ. So now God gives us a name after we've come back to him, called an ambassador. And what's an ambassador? It's a representative of Christ. We have ambassadors in this world. We have an ambassador, we all, we, every nation has an ambassador to other nations. They are representatives of those other nations. And they, and representatives means representing Jesus to the world. Mm -hmm. Ambassador of Christ, you now represent Jesus back to a world that lost him, that lost God, that lost the Holy Spirit, that lost that true knowledge, that lost that holiness, that completeness and you represent Jesus and allow that work of the Holy Spirit to reconcile, to bring them back mm -hmm. into relationship, into right standing with the Father. How do we become ambassadors? How do we represent Jesus to the world? We have to follow his example. And what was Jesus's example on, his, on, this, on this world? In this world, it was of righteous servanthood. Jesus is the prime example of what righteous servanthood was. So Jesus is talking here in Mark 10, 45. And it says, for even the son of man came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life Mm -hmm. ransom payment an offering for many amen jesus is talking about himself i came here my job here was not to be served 
but to serve others and to give up my life as a payment. That is the blueprint, <laughs> that is the context, that is the instruction, because Jesus was the prime example of being a righteous servant. I'm gonna go through this text in Philippians 2, 3 to 9, just um, to kind of drive this home and to talk about one thing. Jesus, again, uh, in Philippians, Paul is talking about the attitude of Christ. He's saying to the church, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Humble yourself. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Mm -hmm. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, yeah. which is to not be selfish. Do not try to impress people. Be humble. Thinking of yourselves, not thinking of yourselves better than you should, but looking out for others' interests above your own. That is the, the same attitude that Christ had. Me in the back, you in the forefront. My life is here for you. Because Christ, though he was God, did not think of equality to God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took the humble position of a slave. That word slave, same word as servant, as was born as a human being. So Christ gave up what he thought, he, he, his own privileges, his own life, and took on a different position. I'm talking to your lives now. I'm talking to who you are now as a person mm -hmm. on the position as a servant. That word servant in those texts is the word doulos. And it's, it means one who gives himself up to another's will. It is service used by Christ in extending and advancing his cause among men. That is what servanthood is. It is a person who decides to give himself up to another person's will. Mm -hmm. And in the Christian context, in the context of a believer, we give up ourselves to Christ and advance his cause. Mm -hmm. and that is the relationship we have with others. That is, our, that is our purpose on earth. That is our assignment here. Yes. We have dominion, but we serve with that dominion. We're a part of the kingdom, but we are advancing the will, the nature, the culture, the mind of our king mm -hmm. earth as servants. Amen. How do we do that? Through the manifestation of the spirit. The spirit is doing the work through us and in us. It says here, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for what? For the profit of all. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that we get the power, we get the authority, we get the, the anointing, we get the endowment, we get the enablement that looks different in each of us because God created us, even though in his likeness and image, he created us to do different things in all concert, one body, different, different functions, mm -hmm. benefit of us all. So here's the tension. Here's what has happened to us in this modern day life, in, in, in eras before us, this is the tension. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end is the way to death. This is what happens. And I want you to think about this. There are things that we think, I've said this before in, in other discussions we've had, there are things that we think are good there are things that we think are noble. There are things that we think should happen. There are things, there are ways that we have taken or paths we have taken that seem to be good for us and good for other people. But if it's not righteous servanthood, yes. if, it's not, uh, if it's not a faith, mm -hmm. if it's not of, as Morris talked about, something that you can see or believe as evidence from the Holy Spirit that causes you to believe, the way of it is death. Amen spiritual and then physical death. Mm -hmm. If we are not in perfect communion, if we are not letting the Holy Spirit lead us, the steps of a righteous man and woman are ordered mm -hmm. God. If we're not living in that vein, things can seem good, things can seem profitable, things can seem healthy, things can seem needful, 
But if it's outside righteousness, yes, outside that right relationship, if it's outside that right standing, you are you're playing, you're, you're playing you're gambling with whether that is of the spirit or is of your flesh, which you can, with your eyes, what you can taste, what you can hear, what you can feel. Because if you're not led by the spirit, you're led by your flesh. Mm -hmm. And your flesh often is deceitful and in all its ways, most of the time. So I just put this here in the same book in Proverbs. It was talking about a woman who cared nothing about the path of life. She staggers down a crooked trail and doesn't even realize it. If your steps are not ordered, you are a wanderer. Amen. Forth, you're going up and down. You try to reinvent yourself. You're trying to think about other avenues, thinking about new businesses, all this that may be good if they're ordered. But if they're not, you're you are wandering through this life and not really understanding what your purpose and your assignments are for any season or for any time. Again, Jesus is the example. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, because of what he did, God elevated him to the place of highest honors and gave him the name above all names. I, brought, I said this, I, I put this up here because there is a death that has to happen. Uh, a death that has to happen to us if we wanna be righteous servants. And that is a death to our own wills. That is a death to our own perspectives. It's a death to our own wants. When you decided to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, he became the one that redeemed you, restored you, reconciled you. But he's the one when you say, I thank you, Lord, or I praise you, Lord, you're saying, I thank, I'm thank. i thanking the one who owns me. Mm -hmm. Lord means owner. I'm thanking the one who has control of me. I'm talking to the one who tells me what to do, how to do, when to do, what to do, and, and where to do it. And oftentimes what we do as people and as believers is we say, we want to do this, Lord, what do you think? Or we want to go here, what, Lord, what do you want me? Can you bless this? Or I think this is a good thing for me. Lord, help me accomplish this. It's not the way of a kingdom. <clears throat> kingdom citizens and ambassadors represent him. We get instruction from him and then we execute. And so there is a dying that has to happen in your heart, in your mind. If you wanna say you are a true son or daughter, or if you wanna say that you are working for the kingdom. So Jesus again tells you how to do it. So it says, Jesus explained to you, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He only, does what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son does also. Why do we think as humans that we should be doing any different? Jesus showed us the way to be, to be a righteous servant because he was in perfect communion with the father. He only did what he saw the father doing and he only did what he told him to do. Same for us. And so even as I'm talking, um, they are, we all have areas in our lives, or <clears throat> lives in general, where we didn't do what the Father told us to do. We did what we wanted to do. Amen. We didn't say what the Father wanted to do. We said what we wanted to say. And I say to you, some of, some of this may sound like overwhelming, like, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe that decision to take this career was not the right one, or maybe this decision to move here wasn't the right one. I tell you, recognize it and ask God for your exit strategy. Because you can always go back to the spirit. You can always go back to God and say, okay, Father, what's next for me now? Maybe I did a misstep here, but Father, now I want you to order my steps from this day forward. Mm -hmm. So there's no condemnation, but again, there needs to, be, needs to be a decision. If you want to serve, you have to be in a place where you're only doing what the Father says. And you're only saying what he says and you're only doing this. And then he will give you everything you need. Under that covenant of grace, you have everything you need pertaining to life and to godliness. That is available to you still today. And so I pray as I'm talking that some of you are going to get revelation, that you're going to get clarity, that you're going to get um, instruction by the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you about what is next. What is your next step? 
Because as you continue to do that, as you continue to set yourself aside, as you continue to meditate on the word, as you continue to consecrate yourself, you start to get that detail. You start to get that instruction. And then your steps more and more are ordered until every single day of your life they're ordered, until everything you say is ordered, until everything you do is ordered. And then you become that righteous servant of yes. God and the kingdom of God that is within you now starts coming out of you, mm -hmm. starts being manifested on the earth. Amen. 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 Our, again, Jesus is saying, I've not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who has sent me himself has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the father has told me. Jesus says, he just said to his disciples, when I leave, these works shall you do and even greater works, right? So even though Jesus is giving us the commandment and he's giving us the example, he's saying greater works shall you do. And you will do these greater works if you follow my example, which is being, yeah. mm -hmm. which is having the righteousness, which is, which is by faith, which is being so connected that you are always getting in real time evidence that you can see or evidence that you can see that causes you to believe, that causes you to do, that causes you to act and causes you to say. So there is a result to righteous servanthood. Romans 6, 17 and 18 says, but thanks be to God that you who are once slaves to sin or servants of sin mm -hmm. become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. That speaks of consecration. That speaks of the word. That speaks of um, your obedience to the word. Of you saying that I'm going to be quickly obedient. I'm going to quickly say yes. Um, I told you guys um, a couple of weeks ago, um, a period of time where the Holy Spirit was just telling me, go here, do this, don't go here, do that. And I was not quickly obedient every time because my natural state wanted me to question. But there is an obedience that's coming to you guys that when he says go, you're gonna go. When he says read this, you're gonna do this. When he says stop, you're gonna stop. When he says wait, you're gonna wait. Mm -hmm. Because when you were set free from sin, you become a servant of righteousness. You come, become a servant of that level of revelation, that servant of that level of instruction and te teaching and counsel. But now you are free from the power of sin and become slaves or servants of God. Now you do these things that lead to holiness and result in each other. Mm -hmm. Amen. So what this is telling me now is that righteous servanthood leads to holiness, which is that completeness, which is that wholeness, which is a result of the spirit's complete, perfect communion with your spirit, resulting to com in complete and whole communion with your soul, which is your mind, your will, and emotions, and then your body. Righteous servanthood leads to that state of wholeness and results in eternal life. And if you remember um, us talking about this before, that word eternal, I don't remember, I can't remember the, the Greek word off the top of my head, but it speaks to the quality of life. It speaks to the kind of life. It speaks to um, the beauty of the life that you can have if you are a righteous servant. So you get holiness back and you get eternal life, that quality of life as God has it. So not only is there a result to righteous servanthood, there is a blessing from righteous servanthood. And I'm gonna end with this. I'm, I think I got 15 minutes, um, but I, I more thought I couldn't get through these slides, but I'm getting through them. Um, I'm gonna end with this, with this story uh, of Jesus. This is at the end of his ministry. So Jesus has done all these signs and wonders and miracles. He's given power and authority to his disciples. They're doing amazing things. And it's about time for Jesus to leave earth. He's with his disciples and he says, and he's washing their feet. They're together and Jesus gets down. The God in human flesh on this earth gets down and in the preceding verses says that he takes, um, I believe a cloth 
or a rag and wraps it around his waist like servants in that house used to do, servants in those houses used to do when visitors used to come. In, th in that day, when visitors used to come into your house, your servant would wrap a towel around their waist and wash the dirt off their feet at the door before they came in the door. Jesus himself now is with his own disciples, wraps this towel around his waist and starts to prepare to wash the feet of his disciples. Servanthood, I'm in the back, you're in the front, my interests over yours. I lay down my privilege, I lay down my title, I lay down my influence, I lay down whatever this world may think is important for you, for your interests. And when he came to Simon Peter, Peter says, Lord, are you really going to wash my feet? Jesus replies to Peter and says, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. Mm -hmm. Peter says, no, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus replies, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Amen. Jesus is saying, unless I show you what servanthood is like in practice, mm -hmm. you can't be a part of me because that's who I am. Mm -hmm. And then after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and said, do you understand what I was doing? You mm -hmm. call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's really what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. Mm -hmm. I have given you, this is the, what the word of God is saying. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Know that you know these things. God will bless you for doing them. That word bless, um, is as part of a larger terminology that talks about being happy, about the empowerment to have good success. Mm -hmm. The blessing versus the curse means, curse means empowerment to fail, blessing means the empowerment to succeed. It means a state of being where you're favored by God. So all those things now are available to you because of your position as a righteous servant, because that's what Jesus did. And Jesus used this the act of washing somebody's feet, the act, the action of taking the dirt off, the act of cleansing, the act of removing and, and allowing people to be in a better state because of your presence, because of your gifts, because of what the spirit is giving you um, as an example and ties a blessing to, and uh, ties a blessing to that. And so um, that's where I'm gonna end but I hope that makes sense that what I think we've lost in, in our lives in, a modern, in modern day society is the reality that we need to be on this earth as righteous servants, as people who are willing to serve, lay their lives down, lay what we thought our lives should be and say, Father, as you being Lord of our lives, what would you have us to do? How can we serve? So I think, um, I would just, as I pray for you guys this week, I think that you should ask that question. What does my life look like as a righteous servant, Father? Show me what that looks like. Show me what's next. Uh, course correct me, counsel me, teach me. Let me know what's next so I can be that righteous servant that brings the kingdom of heaven down to earth. Amen. Have any questions? or thoughts as we wrap up. Amen, that was very beautiful. I enjoyed it. And I am just so, so overjoyed right now of the teaching of um, Leisha, you and Morris. And I am just so blessed and our family is so blessed to have the both of you to teach us and bring us the word on Sunday morning. And I would like to um, even try to um, get a lot of more people on to hear this because that's what we need to do sometimes. Go back to the beginning, you know, because, you know, we, we done been on this road for so long, so long, you know, and 
we think that we are doing what God would have us to do, but really there is so much more. And I think going back to the beginning, what brought our, you know, our minds and and think about uh, how we really supposed to be doing things and building the kingdom of God. Amen. That's, amen. 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 Uh, I, have a, I have a comment to make. Can, Lisa, can you bring that slide back up that you had? That, Which one? Um, the slide where uh, he said, freely you have received, so freely give. Okay, give me one second. I was listening to this part that you had made and it just brought a lot of clarity um, on a number of different things. Let me find it. Hold on one second. So well, while you're finding it, this, this scripture that you pointed out describes righteous servanthood. I mean, like flawlessly. So when you pull it up, he said, there it is. He said, as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils, for freely you have received, so freely give. Mm -hmm. And so it brought me back to um, the story of, of, of Peter uh, in front of the gates. And so he's saying, freely you have received everything pertaining to life and godliness. Freely I have given this all to you. This is the covenant of grace, which means it's unmerited, undeserved. I'm giving all of these things to you freely. So he said, freely I've given you all these things. This, this, this anointing, it's not for you. It's for you to be a distributor into the world. Uh, this power, this authority, all these things are not for you. So here we have Paul, I'm sorry, Peter, in front of the gate, and then you have the beggar there begging for alms, begging for money. And he asked Peter for money, and Peter says, silver and gold, we know the scripture inside out, have I none, but such as I have. He said, freely it has been given, so now freely give. So here's Peter saying, such as I have, I give unto you. I don't got money. I don't got gold. I don't got silver. But what I do have, I'm here to give it to you. Well, what do you have, Peter? I, I got the Holy Spirit. I got this anointing living on the inside of me. I, I have Christ living on the inside of me. I am the anointed. I have the fullness of God in my human body. I have the wisdom. I have the power of God. I have the authority, which is the legal right to command. I have been given dominion over this territory called earth. I have charge over the angels. I am the righteousness of God. I have a man named Jesus living on the inside of me. Uh, he's the author and the finisher of this thing called faith. You have all these things that's been given to you. And he's saying, go out in the earth and freely give it to my people. Freely yeah. let people experience my love, my power, my wisdom, my revelation. Go out and give it. So Peter said, I don't got no gold. I don't got no money. But what I do have that God gave me, I am going to give it to you today. Then he says, now pick up your bed and walk. What he just gave that man far outweighs any silver, any gold, anything else he could have gave him in the physical. He said, I am going to hit you with this anointing. I'm going to give you a demonstration of this power because it was freely given to me only to freely give unto you. And the man picked up his bed and walked just as instructed. That is righteous servanthood. There is a demand and we are here to supply that demand. All this anointing and Holy Spirit and power and authority and wisdom and revelation, all of that is phenomenal, but it's only meant to be a distributor of. Amen. We are servants. We are here to serve the people. They are supposed to experience Jesus through us. This is why we are salt and light in the earth. It's been freely given, and now we freely distribute it and give it out to the people that are in need of it. Amen. So that, that was that. When you, gave, when you gave that scripture as an example, it just made me think back to that story with Peter. So I just wanted to share that briefly. Uh, but I'll open up the floor for any other questions, comments concerning what, what Leisha taught on today. 
anybody, feel free. Well, I have no comments, to, but to say that it was well received. And sometimes when it's well received, there's not a lot to say. Amen. But I Amen thank you that. for the word. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for letting God use you this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I, I just sent a text. I sent a text or chat out to everybody. I don't know if you guys got it, but um, it was really um, a blessing to be able to be a part of the service and stuff today. And it was just like a, a confirmation. See, that's why I didn't want to say it because I knew I was going to start crying. It was a, um, a confirmation for me that to just remember to get my life back on track, you know, and to be that person who I know that I'm called to be and not to be um, not to be afraid to stand out. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. My name is Yvette. Um, I just wanted to thank you both for today. It's been a long time since I've attended a service and this is really something that I needed and something just in my own personal space been questioning a lot of things but this is just allowing me to make sure I go back to what is God saying um, mm -hmm. am I being righteous am I being faithful in in these decisions um, and ultimately seeking him so thank you both this morning mm -hmm. amen. amen thank you thank you well thank you all for your your comments and your feedback is greatly appreciated um, and I would just say, I would just encourage you to consistently remind yourself that you are the righteousness of God. Shame and condemnation was nailed on that cross when Jesus was crucified. He said, I'm taking shame and condemnation to the grave with me. And so when we find ourselves falling short, it's up to you to remind yourself, I am still the righteousness of God. I am still the righteousness of God. What is that doing? It's putting you back in the right frame of mindset to get back on track and finish running this race of faith. Mm -hmm. Man. Every time, you, every, every time you have awareness that you have fallen short and you're disappointed in something that you did, something that you said, something that you didn't do, remind yourself not later in that moment. Say it out loud. I am the righteousness of God. I am still the righteousness of God. And that puts you right back in the mindset. All right, let me get back mm -hmm. on this. Race. I am the righteousness of God. And nothing will remain separate back. from his love. That's why he sealed you with his Holy Spirit so you can remain in his righteousness. Amen. So thank you, thank you all for coming today. Thank you for sharing in the gospel with us. Um, thank you to my wife, Leisha, for preaching that uh, amazing message of Amen. the righteousness of servanthood. And I look forward to seeing you guys all next Sunday. I, I sent Amen. those books out um, for, I hope some of you got them. If you haven't received them, uh, let me know so I can get your name and address and there's a book I wanted everybody to have so I'll make sure those who don't have it have it this week okay and then I I, I, I want to ask uh, do you think it'll be you all will be able to teach on this another Sunday so that way I can uh, invite a lot of you know you know people on to hear, hear yeah, the absolutely. yeah absolutely yeah yes. I mean, we can absolutely do a part two and go in further depth and just reinforce that same message. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And then um, could you let me know in advance so that way I'll be able to, you know, get my invites out. Okay, absolutely. Okay. I'll thank do just you. that. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, Lisa, you want to close us in prayer? Sure. Um, so you. we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, your precious sheep who are on this call today. We thank you for um, just understanding. Thank you for revelation. We thank you, Father, that even as Moore said that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I think yeah. now that even as we um, depart, let there be a, um, a soaking of the Holy Spirit over the hearts and minds. Yeah of those who are on this call today. I thank you right now that people don't feel stressed or worried about decisions in the past. They just make a decision today in this moment to become those righteous servants that you have called us to be in the earth. And I thank you right now that in the upcoming days and weeks, there'll be such clarity coming to the mind. There'll be such a yes. there'll be such detail. There'll be such uh, peace because yes. right now that we are now moving and, and ordered by you that our steps yes. are in sync with yours. 
that yes, are Lord, Jesus. in sync with yours, that we put on the mind of Christ today. And so yeah. right now, let there be, I even heard the word relief, let there be a relief coming. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Even, even like an exhaling, let there be an exhalation coming to the yes. let go of what was behind us, but we press oh, yes. the Bless high me. calling of Jesus. And so yeah. I thank you right now, Father, that that minds are just open, that hearts are open, and that we know that you are a God that is still speaking, that you are not deaf nor dumb, but you yes. communicate, you want to um, show us your plan, show us your purpose, show us yes. your thoughts and your plans towards us. We will not um, turn our backs on you. We will yes, be given us through your Holy Spirit to bring your kingdom to this earth. Your word oh, yes. come, your will be done on oh, earth yes. as oh, it is in heaven. So I thank you right now, Father, yes. for the testimony, yes. for thank the you, repetition, Jesus. for the confession of your sons and daughters, yes. of the glorious yes. um, manifestation of your word in their lives this week. And we yes. praise you, Father. We thank you, glory. We thank oh, yes. you, we glorify you, God, you. that we know yes. that we have this power and this authority, yes. not of our own doing, but yes. in you. It is yes. you. Yes. you Lord. So we thank you and we bless thank you. you in your name we pray. Amen. Yes, Amen. 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 I hope you guys have a wonderful week and we'll see you next week. Yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much, Morris and Alicia. Thank you. God bless everyone. Love you. Love you all.